Welcome to episode 12 of Coffee and Donuts with Adam. Today, we are super stoked to have an extra special guest, Mr. Bob Hemphill, now of Crickets and uh, Cicada Seeds. Uh, you can follow him on Instagram at Mr. Bob Hemphill or uh, Crickets and Seeds, Crickets and Cicada Seeds at Cricket and Cicada Seeds. What's up, man? How are you? Doing good, man. Happy to have uh, some time to talk cannabis with you guys. I love yeah, that you're on here, man. Thank you so much. Like we said, um, we're both fans. Like I, I've listened, I listened to your old podcast episode uh, a long time ago. I guess whenever it came out, and like always thought you had like a really cool story. Uh, and re- listen to the recent one as well. So uh, shout out to the podcast. But yeah, we're we're both fans, so it's cool to have you on, man. Hell yeah! Every day makes it real easy for me. He just asks the the good questions, and I just come with the answers. So, that you already a got a bong out in the garden and everything. Is that a bong in front of you in your hands? Yeah. Yep, you know oh, it. Yes. We're on the right car. Definitely smoking some Afghani already in the morning, or what? Or what are you doing? Yeah, I do uh, Afghani all day, every day. Um, smoking some Northern Lights uh, by uh, Puck BC1. It's the um, NL cut I got from my homie Gabe Ruth. Um, his buddy sourced it in Humboldt in the late nineties and, um, Kevin, uh, Jay and I, and, um, AK Bean Brains all saw it and we all thought it was NL5 independently, but he got it just labeled as NL. So I just keep it, uh, calling it NL. So it's got a little bit of terpenaline in there and it passes that along to its offspring. Um, I'm not the biggest fan of terpenaline, but, uh, it, the, the hash plant, mix with it is really pleasant and um you know i've been uh, doing a lot of breedings this summer and i haven't harvested any fresh nuts for uh, about six or eight months now and um i'm getting close here in a few weeks i got some sour diesel and chem d and um chem 91 and my sensi star cut that i got from jj and i got the sensi star cut i got from wick family farms and um I got the garlic bud from Wick Farm Family Farms in there. And um, they're going to be harvesting those over the next week. And then uh, about two weeks later, uh, I'm having a bunch of uh, Puck BC2 outcrosses and the Puck BC3 um, testers should be finished. Uh, I got uh, in the first round, I have uh, the Puck bc2 crossed a shoreline um a skunk cut i got from wick family farms um the two sensi stars both of them and um that's the first round of testing with the bc2 outcrosses i got about i crossed it to about 20 different things because i saw how well the bc1 outcrosses did and it's just like adds a potency bud structure and amazing plant structure to everything that i across the bc ones too so i'm yeah, excited about cool, that man. it sounds like you said at the beginning you have a lot of different projects underway one of the things that i find funny about adam asking about the bong is uh on the most recent podcast i think you were talking about how like you actually got to rip through all this stuff to to test it you know like you are yeah, uh, the tester of all this stuff. So you gotta like basically chief through all this stuff all day long, uh, which I I found funny. But uh, you brought up the the hash plant, and that's something that Adam and I were you know curious about because we talk about hash a lot, but in a maybe kind of a different way. And so uh, we were kind of curious what you feel. You were talking about bringing it in uh, as a combination in this case, but what do you feel like the hash plants bring? Uh, or or where do they get their name from? So, yeah, that's an interesting point and something that, you know, people that are newer to cannabis uh, would be confused upon because traditionally hash plant um, was referred to Afghani genetics or maybe Lebanese genetics that were from land race strains that were traditionally made hash. You know, we're talking for hundreds of years, possibly thousands of years. Okay. And now when um everyone, the newer generation talks about hash plants, they're talking about like stuff that makes good uh hash, you know, like 
tasty, super flavorful. That's what they call a, a hash plant. And, um, you know, this traditional hash plants make good hash, but it's, it's, it's not the same thing. You know, these, uh, were strains that were land race that were, um, probably the best variety for making hash that they had access to, but they were also cultivars that did well in their, um, region, you know, and I'm always been a big fan of the, uh, Afghanis, you know, especially, you know, like the Hindu Kush mountain range style stuff. And, um, that's where I, I think this, uh, hash plan is based off of it's So, you know, um, Neville's work originally, he, he came out and he got the Pacific Northwest hash plant out in Portland. And, um, he brought it back to Amsterdam, crossed it to Northern Lights, number one. And then he crossed it back to the Pacific Northwest hash plant. And that was his hash plant release. And, um, that's where the puck AK super skelly hash plant comes out of. And that's the, the hash plant I've been back crossing. And that, um, cut has been in Colorado, especially around the Crested Butte area since, you know, the late eighties. And, um, it's been really popular staple with the, the deadheads and, um, I was able to get it in 2014 when I was out in Colorado through, uh, P bud Mike and Rob Carney and, um, Rod, Rob Carney was the one that had, uh, been holding it for all that time. And, um, you know, it just all came together when I got out to California and kick, you had the NL number one, you know, and, um, I'd always wanted to recreate some of the strengths for my youth that I thought were the best ones to NL hash plant crosses and the rapture was NL hash plant NLG 13. Um, so yeah, it took a while working that back, back crossing it. And, um, you know, the results are uh, better than I could have imagined to be honest. I'm really stoked with it. Uh before we move, I, you guys were talking about testing, and then I re, I listened to that. Um, you know, you were talking about how you're you're not you're, you're non-commercial, so you're not doing things on a super large scale, um, and you know you're a mom and pop with you and Hannibal, um, and so you you physically, you know, sensorily taste all everything that you're going through. You you are the sensory judge of your own stuff, I, and I think that's really cool. Um, but I guess what I want to get out of that is. What exactly are you looking for? Are you looking for whenever you are looking for like a like let's say a winner from these taste testings? Um, would it be a flavor that's balanced, or would it be just you know mainly the aroma notes that you're going for? Or are you going for all those notes? Maybe the aroma notes and the flavor notes, um, and how those balance. Um, maybe there's some complexity there that you're looking for or something. But maybe you, you know you could take over and just kind of tell us the gist of how you you test these things. Yeah, yeah. So I do my testing. Um, flavor is the the least thing I'm concerned about. Um, potency and effect and the quality of the high. Um, I feel like, you know, the quality of the highs that a lot of these strains I'm working on are, I'm really getting it. And, um, you know, they're flavorful and loud too. You know, they, they taste, uh, the, every strain is different. And I, I'm working so many different projects. It's uh, I can't, you know, like the purple Hindu Kush projects, those are going to be about as flavorful as anything gets, you know, and then, you know, the hash plant puck stuff, that's very flavorful too, but like, it's like a garlic, funky, um, hard to describe terps, you know, almost like chem dog, but like, that's not what I'm really focused on at all. I'm focused on um, pain killing, um, mental, physical stuff that makes you feel better stuff that makes you not worry about the news uh stuff that has no stress no paranoia um i like a couch lock indica but um most of the the lines that i work heavy on are uh not couch locking for me at least and people that smoke indicas hard um they're more of a pain killing um also take the edge off mentally so you're not you know 
stressed out about society or just aggro, you know. Um, I grew up in Northern Virginia, right outside of D.C., and if I wouldn't have found cannabis, you know, um, God knows, only know where, where I'd be. You know, I'm sure I would have had a, some trouble with the law, that's for damn sure, through other shit, but thank God I found uh, psychedelics and cannabis, you know, through the Grateful Dead community and um, in plant medicine is my number one goal in life. And, um, that's what I breed for, you know, um, is, uh, you know, a plant that is very old school. I feel like the quality of the buzz has been lost in a lot of these, uh, strains and it's really just bottlenecked and it has the same effect. And, um, you know, I, I've been smoking since the early nineties and, you know, back then cannabis was all over. I remember when I moved out to Humboldt in the late nineties, that every farmer grew five different types of cannabis and every farmer on every hill grew every different, five different types of, you know, they didn't all grow the same five types, you know, you get a bag and be named after the town it was grown in and it'd be several different types of cannabis mixed together. And um, just the way the market has gone, you know, it just, we lost everything because um, it wasn't profitable for people to keep around these genetics, you know, it was only profitable to keep around the, the strain of the week that everyone wanted to pay money for, you know? So like, for example, in the early 2000s, it was all the purples, granddaddy, Urkel, um, stuff like that, lavender. And then, you know, it switched to OGs and chem dogs. And then it was cookies and, you know, most of the time people just drop the older stuff and don't keep it. And um, I've always been concerned about that since I was in the mid nineties. Cause I, I, that's when I started to see stuff disappearing. So when something special, uh, you know, came my way, I, I've been trying to hold it. I've been holding some strains for over 20 years at this point. And um, I'm just really focused on trying to get, each cultivar into seed form that represents the the clone so everyone can experience that and it's so much easier to keep seeds than um clones and you know uh the viruses and you know just a pain in the ass of keeping the clones alive it's just seeds are just so much easier and um you know it's better for the environment you got to you know you can keep them in the drawer rather than keeping the the lights on them all the time. I just really want to get all my old clones into seed forms that represent um, the true side. And I, you know, when I start, I try to pick males that are close, close as possible genetically to, to keep the qualities of the strain. You know, for example, when I did the puck back cross, I started off with an NL1. I crossed it to Pacific Northwest hash plant clone that I got from Bodhi. And then started the back cross project. So it was almost, you know, like at this point, one of the most inbred lines that I've ever seen in cannabis that's been created. Um, you know, I'm not talking about a pure inbred line like, you know, uh, Tom Hills Hayes or something, or uh, not, not Hayes, I mean, the deep chunk, something like that, that was uh, Afghani is probably more inbred, but as far as, you know, Neville's work of taking the NL1 and then back crossing it to only 25% NL1. I've taken it well into the 90s. And um, I try to keep everything as pure as possible. You know, like I'm working on a master Kush project. I used a Kabul Kush for that. And now I'm at a back cross one off a of master Kush. It's a cut I've been holding for 20 some years. And just uh you know just really important to me that, that i keep these medical qualities with the cannabis you know that's the number one goal it's not really the the, the flavor you know i think i think something going off that makes me think of um to, that i want to ask you is um it's let's go back again like something that you'd consider a winner, you know, as, as you were saying off of the effect of it, um, you know, you've tasted it, you know, the flavor, you know, the effect, how do those kind of winners of yours compare to like, let's say a 
blander cookie fam type thing and not to talk shit in that regard because i know that they have good stuff i just i would just like kind of like your perspective on maybe the differences and like what you're looking what you know so anyways i don't know if i clarified that well enough but so like you know i feel like you know those guys have done an amazing job uh cornering the market and you know, bottlenecking the gene pool, you know, um, everything is goes back to cookies or sherbet or some shit like that nowadays, you know, and um, it is amazing cannabis, especially for uh, the novice uh, consumer and especially for the grower. Um, they're dense, hard, beautiful nugs, you know, they're purple coated with crystals. But, you know, um, I really feel like those strains don't have the quality of the high of especially the medical aspects of the stuff I'm talking about, especially uh, the mental side, you know, um, that's why strains like the puck AK, you know, super scaly hash plant was been around since the eighties is because it has amazing medical qualities, you know, and um, that's the reason chem dog 91 has been around since, you know, 91. So like when I'm doing a seed project, you know, if it's chem dog project or if it's a sensi star project, I'm going to grow the original clone with the testers and I'm going to want to smoke them all together. And if they're not as quality or better, you know, I failed and I'm not going to release that. Um, luckily I've been, uh, stuff's been clicking well lately and you know, I, I'm feeling like some of this shit is better than these uh, clones that have been kept around for a long time. You know, I've, I definitely feel like the Puck BC2 back crosses, you know, I found so many plants that were just as good or uh, better than the Puck, especially at this point now that she's, you know, about 40 years old, you know, it's uh, these new seeds are just growing better with, uh, you know, younger, you know, I'm not really a gen genetic specialist, so I can't really, you know, talk a about shit like that but like you know i'm hard knocks i've been growing cannabis uh for a long time i've been breeding since the mid 90s i've been i do production you know i have done and you know so much production through my whole life you know and um i know cannabis and that's what i judge by is the quality of these uh clones that i've been holding by you know i almost always grow the chem d you know and uh when I don't smoke my chem D or, you know, my triangle Kush or my headband jars, that's when I know I really fucking done well, you know? So, um, that's how I judge my cannabis. So, so you mentioned the master Kush, uh, and it, you're holding it for quite a while. What's one of your oldest cuts, if not your oldest? The oldest that I've been holding or the oldest one in general? The oldest one that you've been holding. Um, so I have not been holding it the whole time, you know, it's been a group of friends, but the Fairfax four way, you know, I have it now, um, trying to get it tissue cultured, actually have a friend, um, that is working on it right now. And, um, one of my best friends bought that pack in, um, Amsterdam and, uh, we've been holding that one since 95. Um, when I got out and cali and um i was in humboldt that that's when i really started holding shit super hard um 99 that's when i got the churn wreck the master kush um got the headband a few years later um i had sour diesel a few years later um but yeah it might it might be train wreck um and some 99 it's just uh steady me without you know the help of friends and stuff you know yeah that's funny i remember the the four-way i actually i share that with you i grew up in northern virginia uh i was born in arlington lived in alexandria pretty much till 95 or 96 um so that's kind of funny that you mentioned that one but you know it's it almost is ironic to me that you've been holding these cuts and, and taking care of them and obviously there goes there's a lot that goes into that which i'd love to kind of unpack with you but also it's 
kind of funny that now like you're using these cuts to make seeds because they are almost like this better option like you said earlier at the beginning when you were holding these cuts did you ever imagine that or like foresee yourself like holding these to make seeds or was it just strictly like you're holding it because it was a fire cut Dude, I was just holding it because it was a fire cut and I would make crosses and um, I would just use whatever, you know, um, unrelated strains and I, it would make good stuff, you know, and I've always made good stuff, you know. Um, I was out in, you know, Colorado in the late 90s and, I, you know, everything I grew was stuff I bred, you know, and um, it was a... Uh, I had gotten seeds of the rapture cross by uh, super silver haze. And I crossed that um, to NLAK males. And I just selected out of that and found amazing shit. But, um, you know, it's just like, oh man, I forgot where we were going with that. <laughs> I, I, have, I think, or well, I actually maybe I just forgot what I was going to ask, but no worries i was actually I, we were just connecting the points of like holding the cuts and then making seeds and like yeah, okay thinking about so that. yeah like i used to make a lot of uh seeds with my shit and they were good but like they weren't uh like what i'm doing now you know since then i've learned a lot about genetics um i got real interested in american pit bull terrier history and um research bloodlines and learned about making uh pure lines just by reading i've never bred a dog in my entire life because you know i wouldn't trust most people with a, a goldfish let alone a pit bull you know um but the history uh was fascinating especially uh with the pure lines and such and then um when i got to west coast and bamboo brought me in with kq um i learned a lot more about genetic preservation and the quality of pure lines and keeping stuff as pure as possible and that's when it just all fucking clicked you know um like i'd mentioned i brought the puck hash plant out from colorado and, and kq had the nl1 and um then Bodie had the pacific northwest hash plant you know and nl1 pacific northwest hash plant back cross is what made the puck and it was just like tight i'd never had the opportunity to breed a family tight like that before i'd always made cool crosses and shit but it was never like a tight pure family like that and um that's the type of shit that i uh learned from research and pitbull history you know is uh you know like they kept the families tight and pure and they felt like uh you know other pitbulls were like from different lines are like a completely different breed of dog, you know? Um, so I, you know, had a different aspect of, of looking at it after that research than the mentoring um, from Kegu and with BAM and the whole mission of Coastal Seeds was the preservation, you know? And um, it just all came together. And since then I've been on a serious mission to get all all my best clones in the seed form and using males that um, represent them as close as possible. You know, I have like the train wreck at uh, Backcross One. And for that male, I used A5 Hay Hayes Neville's Cut, crossed a Thai um, male that Karma bred and Bodhi selected. It's that famous male. And, um, you know, I just tried it uh do stuff like that and it and it's really working out well for me the stuff is uh the the lines are easier to clean up and um they're easier to purify and there's uh not like two different sides of genetics coming in and it's it's something that's really similar and it's, they just blend well and then, and then once i start the back cross project with something that's blended well and um, there's only basically one type of cannabis in on F1. The back crosses of uh, those are just really working out well, you know. And um, it's something that's really, you know, um, true to me because, you know, I, I just have been holding these cuts for so long. And, I, you know, when I was doing this, I didn't have the idea that this would be the, the end game at all, you know. But I've always been interested in um, keeping them around 
keep the medical qualities around. And then I've always been interested in um, the environment and conservation and, you know, obviously, or, um, you know, people don't know, but like, you know, um, I just like fucking feel good about this project, about like um, getting these things out to the people as pure as possible so people can breed with them, so people can do seed increases, open pollinations, and they'll have pure stock from these lines for the rest of their life, or if they want to start breeding projects, the fact that I've been taking these into pure lines, um, it's just better breeding stock, you know, especially if someone has like another hash plant clone, for example, that was from Neville, you know, I, I've done fucking years and years of work, fucking get some of these puck BC three seeds and cross them into your shit, you know, like, uh, and, um, that's what I want to have happen. I want people to breed with my shit. I want it to go on. I want it to help people. Um, it's, it's just, uh, feels good. And it, um, I, I'm just like, you know, uh, doing what I can, you know, like whatever falls into my hands, that's, uh, you know, of super high quality, that's all I can do, you know? Well, while we're on the topic of like purifying, purifying th uh, things, it made me think of, there's a new, uh, not, you know, uh, banana god is something I ran, we ran and uh, we grew it in Trinidad this season. Uh, and it, it has this flavor profile that's very similar to the banana OG Oregon Kid Cut. And yep. it's almost like a revitalization of that um organ kid nano g cut and i just wanted to like hear your thoughts like your personal perspective on maybe projects that you felt you revitalized things and maybe and if not no problem i, I think that you kind of already talked a lot about that so um but yeah just to create dialogue i don't know if that helps hell yeah man fucking that uh banana g cut is bomb shit especially that uh Oregon kids cut that circuit relates around Arcata. I've been holding that one for a long time and um, she's really special. I uh, have, haven't seen that banana god that you're talking about and um, I don't know the pedigree, but uh sounds like it's a uh, good shit for sure. I think it's um, like a uh, papaya banana OG and it, it just like, it doesn't have any of that papaya or any of that other, those other notes. It's just straight banana OG run, like candy runs thing all over again. I'm um, sorry to cut you off there. Yeah, is it from Bloom Seed Company? Um, this is actually a Masonic thing that Yeti select Yeti melts, who won second place Ego Clash last year um, with his Jolly Apple, which is this really unique apple um, flavor. But that's beside the point. It is from Yeti melts, and he gifted me the cut of Banana God that was originally a Masonic thing. Oh, yeah. Can I jump in real quick? You you mentioned the word pedigree. You mentioned earlier getting like into learning about the the dog breeding. Is there such a thing as having like a pedigree within genetics? Like you're talking about uh, the preservation work that you guys did at Coastal, and kind of having a different perspective, maybe of like keeping these lines. Uh, I think you said pure. Um, is there something to? I don't know what the question is, but. Uh, uh, almost like is there pedigree to genetics and cannabis or any kind of plant in general okay so that's a very interesting um thing for me and um i did make a a, a pedigree with the puck and i posted it up on instagram on my instagram and on um, crickets and cicada cicada and i was real proud that i could actually make a pedigree with a strain like that um but most of the time cannabis um is unknown like so you know for example if you're using any of the OG Kush cuts or chem dog cuts um in a pedigree and you were going to try and list them what goes behind them would pretty much have to be left blank because it's it's still up to debate what is behind them um and then so as we move forward with cannabis you know um we'll be able to have pedigrees and um stuff like that especially with pure breedings but when we're talking about a lot of the elite original clones um nobody knows they're all a giant can of worms and you know the more you know about the situation and the more you know with the people the you know the more you know that nobody knows you know 
and that's with all all of them all the good ones pretty much and so um you know moving forward you know with cannabis breeders that should definitely be um a thing that you know you should be able to get and um you know just it it, it should be documented you know and um it just you know really hasn't been and um you know you know partly because you know there's a lot of debate upon a lot of the cannabis genetics where they came from and and that's partly because it was all illegal shit back then you know and um as it's moving forward in the legal world you know uh pedigrees you know will definitely be a thing that uh i think most people will have with their strains that they buy you know um at least you'll should be able to find it online or something because you know you know if you want to you know remake a cake you need the fucking recipe you know one more thing on this same topic um before we move on uh Shragam has many more other questions i believe uh but to cram this in there granddaddy is like has been my, one of my favorite uh things since i moved to humboldt um when i turned 18 i'm, I'm 30 now um so like I, I definitely am like later generation i got here late into the situation but granddaddy purple was always my favorite but not only in flower but it made great hatch and i always wondered like why isn't it called granddaddy per hash plant you know um and I, we already talked about that but basically what i wanted to get out of this was you're an afghani person could you tell me a little bit of like the diversity of flavors that come out of afghanis the afghani uh line like berries and i think said yeah, yeah 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 from from my experience uh there's basically two sides uh of the Hindu Kush. Um, there's the sweeter, grapeier, barrier side, and then there's the more acrid, um, musty basement side. You know, and some families will have both. You know, um, but uh, would you say so musty like, would be like a Mister Nice, like a purple Mister Nice? Have you ever gotten that? Like, yeah, I remember that one that used to run around Humboldt back in the day. Um, but. I had friends that grew it and I didn't like it. I used to harass them about how low quality yeah. it was. I mean, turned purple as, as could be, but um, it didn't have a, a quality of buzz or, especially with uh, something that you would expect with uh, Mr. Nice. It just uh, goes to show how uh, all those Amsterdam breeders really lost their fucking, the qualities because they weren't smoking, you know? Um, Neville, you know, had to sell the company to fucking Ben Donkers and Ben Donkers uh, kids were more, you know, interested in doing cocaine than smoking the cannabis. Um, and it's, uh, it's, you know, I love cannabis and I smoke cannabis every day. I take bong hits every morning and it's still a fucking tough job for me to, to test everything. And I'm not even kidding. It is fucking tough, you know? Um, so I understand. So if someone's not really into smoking cannabis, they are not going to do that at all. You know, um, it's just, it's, you know, they're not going to do it. And um, yeah, that Mr. Nice really lost it because, you know, that's G13 hash plant. That's the pedigree on that uh, Mr. Nice. And um, so, you know, um, the granddaddy purple is a really special cut. It's got really amazing medical aspects. Um, it's got amazing flavor. And um, that's one I've been holding on to for a while. And uh, I definitely want to um, work as pure as possible. Um, I believe it's an Urkel across the Santa Creek Big Bud. You know, um, that would be a Pacific Northwest Big Bud. But uh, back cross off of the NL1 that Neville did. I know NL1 was a, 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 a strain that he used a lot as a, a back cross for Afghan genetics. Yeah, you brought up the NL1 uh, a few times today. And I know you guys definitely talk about it on the podcast. And I know there's a couple different versions of that that kind of has stood out throughout time. Can you kind of give us a little rundown on? what you know of the nls and and why you did them so much man so like when i was a kid uh you know in the early 90s like 
most of the time I was smoking Mexican brick weed and I, I like that, you know, but like the first few times I really smoked uh, kind bud, like grown in Northern Virginia, like high quality shit. It was all Northern lights. And um, this is my first experience smoking indica genetics. And I just fell in love right then and there. And um, I always thought it was the best. And, you know, um, Northern Lights, just like Chemdog or Sour Diesel, it's a giant can of worms, <laughs> you know? Um, Seattle Greg's saying is what he's saying now, you know? Um, there's so many contradictions on the, on the line, you know? Um, I, you know, I don't know. You know, some people say uh, um, Neville's one through five was different than the guys in Washington, you know, like Seattle Greg and his friends. Um, I have some NL stock from Jim Ortega via Bodie. Um, I value that as some of the best NL stock I have. Um, Keg use. NL1 um, is also North American stock. Um, that's super high quality stock there. Um, but to be honest with you, I, I really wish I had better Northern Lights um, to be breeding with now in pure form. Um, I have whatever I can get my hands on, you know, and some. Um, so it's, those are the, the families that I've chose to work with. I've grown a lot of other ones that didn't remind me of what I was smoking in the early 90s. You know, they're just completely different. Um, so, you know, I'm just going to keep working with what I have um, and try to work with the best and um, use it as, you know, outcross and breeding stock um because that's where and all i think shines best is in, in crosses so you talked earlier about the fact that there's some bottlenecking in like certain types of uh genetic pools and i feel like uh maybe part of this thing uh with keeping the lines pure is that it keeps the possibilities bigger am i kind of getting that right in in a general term yeah without a doubt with um without different lines there's no way to bring uh new genetics into a line you know um there's uh no way to make you know true f1s to get true hybrid figure without having pure indica lines and pure sativa lines that are you know not hybridized with each other you know that's when you get the true f1 hybrids you know most of these f1s that most uh, modern breeders are doing now are just uh poly hybrids they're not true f1s you know most of the time they're calling an f1 but if you look back in the genetic heritage the pedigree of the strains that they're going back to something on both sides of the pedigree you know um it, that's being you know cookies og chem dog 90 percent of the time you know so um i think uh you know what you know breeders that are working their own lines and their own stuff i think it's gonna um have a big impact on uh the future of cannabis and um the ability of younger breeders with uh, more genetic knowledge to have options, you know, because if you don't have the options, just like I said, I can only breed what I have been saving or what a good friend of mine can give to me, you know? Um, it's like, you know, that's breeders in the future will only have, uh, you know, whatever is preserved by us to work with, you know, and, you know, to, to do a beautiful uh, picture, you need all the different colors, you know, and um, keeping things pure is, you know, what I'm working on. But, you know, the ultimate cannabis uh, plants, I think, will come in the future from people taking the best qualities of pure lines and modern hybrids and 
crossing it together and, uh, you know, using science and large selections to, to um, make the best cannabis in the world, you know? Yeah, you said something cool on the podcast. It was like, I'm not shooting to be the best breeder, but to provide the best breeders, like, basically... I don't remember exactly what you said, but just like you said, now all these different kind of ranges of colors are in, in these genetics to be able to bring out or work with uh, down the line. So I thought that was cool. Give uh, material to breeders that is, you know, quality of material, I think is what, what was the gist of that. But, like a range, a uh, diverse range of characteristics that could cross over. I'm going to go get my cap real quick. <laughs> Yeah, those of you out there, take a bong rip on us, maybe a bloom dab on me. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. So what are you smoking on today? Um, I'm actually doing that banana guy that I was talking about. So um, some of the rosin. I, I really am a big fan of the full melt, as a lot of people will know. I'm, we're, we're big, uh, if you haven't noticed, big hash fans. But originally it started with the flower, of course, and I still understand that the flower is really the um, bringer of the hash. So I love both worlds. If you can't have one without the other. Um, so, but Banana God is something again from Yeti. Um, I'm super thankful to him. He shared a lot of, gifted me a lot of cool things that he's been working on with him and his girlfriend inside. And they've, they've chosen a lot of like really unique flavors in my opinion based off of things that are out there um i don't know actually shiragan would probably be better on talking about the, the flavors but banana god is what i'm smoking right now shiragan you got another question from buddy because I'm, I'm a little oh, I, highly got, I mean i got right some questions you know on, on that's free. always my excuse is just too much caffeine <laughs> no i mean i think one of the interesting things to bring up again in, in the fact that like we're talking about like this hash in one way all the time in a, in a way and, and genetically and stuff and I do feel like for example in hash a lot of the genetics are kind of similar man you know to be honest there, there is there definitely feels to be like a, 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 a little bit of a bottlenecking so I think it would be really interesting to for people to work with like these genetics that uh, like you're saying do have a certain type of pedigree and a certain range of characteristics and and start looking through those and working those lines. Um, but, you know, working lines is a whole other topic right now, I think. How, how, I mean, you know, there's a couple of hash uh, makers that got some of those seeds that I produced in uh, Arcata. You know, hopefully some of them will find some good phenos. Um, I know the Red Lebanese hash plant pug back across a lot of hash makers saw that in the buds that I'd grown out and said it had a lot of promise. And, um, so, you know, uh, when I saw that, I was like, fuck it. I'm going to cross it to papaya. So I crossed it to the papaya, you know, so that I'll add that uh, papaya adds crazy terps, you know, that the modern hash uh, people loved it. <laughs> Just, you know, it makes it super tasty. So I crossed the, the Puck BC2 to the um, papaya clone. And um, That'll be interesting. Modern hash, more modern hash plant uh, across to a very old school uh, hash plant line, you know? Even mm -hmm. though- um, I don't know if you have time, is... but do you smoke hash? Yeah, I do a little bit, but not much, you know? Um, I just do it with friends and, um, and stuff, you know? I, I feel like uh, I just like smoking bomb hits of flowers. It's, it's my... I wanted to selfishly ask, um, you said le red Lebanese. I think I ran it back in 2016. And by ran, I mean, I made hash with red Lebanese. And it was a cut. Um, I know that I don't know where that he got it, but by a vortex, Jesse, i shared it with in her nature, and they grew it um, in Trinidad. Um, that's the lady I've been partnering with for the last few years, um, making all the all the hash on site. Um, prepping it all all on site so it's pretty much single source but i'm not growing it you know so 
a really nice lady is growing it. Um, but anyways, she grew red Lebanese and I wonder, do you happen to know, did you ever possibly share that? Um, you know, who knows, maybe it was a, a hybrid of whatever you yeah. were talking about. Genetics with Jesse. Um, I've known Jesse for a very long time, long before I was on Instagram. Um, I, we just met in Trinidad, actually, at the beach with our dogs, you know. Um, and then uh, just through other people in Trinidad, uh, we had mutual friends, you know. So, um, you know, when I went out to Colorado in 2014, I, I gave a mutual friend of ours, like every single strain I had, you know, and I know he passed a lot of them to Jesse and um, people in Trinidad. So um, there's a good chance, you know, I definitely, you know, used to especially be really friendly with the genetics. Um, when I got on the Instagram and stuff that it, there's a lot of people uh, that have, you know, just burned me and, and just made it unpleasant um, aspect, you know, it seems like most people just want genetics from me, you know, um, just want cuts, uh, rather than being true, honest people, you know, they just come at me with the, you know, motives of wanting stuff. And it's just, it's been going on for so long and it's just, you know, it, it burns you out, you know? So I'm definitely not as loose with the cuts anymore. <laughs> yeah. You got to help out the right people that that's one of the things that you had said briefly in one of the podcasts was like, you know, you like to share things with people that hopefully have, will get your back in the future or, you know, somewhere down the line of, you know, create a small community, not just everybody and their brother. Um, but yeah. So yeah. on that note of like crossing I, to the papaya, I'm curious, like what the motivation for that was, uh, because for example, there's like, I haven't even asked you like what breeding is to you, you know, like I, I, I always want to ask people that, but I don't talk to a lot of breeders and I, I'm always just curious, like what, what does it even mean? And then, yeah, I'll just start with that. Okay. That's so with that cross right there, that was just uh, something that I thought like, you know, uh, some of the guys around Arcata, you know, that make hash might like. Um, so I know the papaya is low in THC, you know, and I know it really passes a really good terpene profile, especially, uh, good hash qualities, um, good, you know, yields and, you know, high terpenes. So um, I know the puck is just high in THC, you know, at least uh, in the mid twenties, you know, the lowest I've seen is 23, you know, I've seen the high twenties. Um, that's the pure BX2. Um, so, you know, what, like I had mentioned, you know, I, I went to a few events around Humboldt and, uh, had my flowers and a few of the hash makers seen them and, you know, thought that some of the crosses had potential, you know, and, um, since, you know, they did that, you know, and, you know, I thought that I'd throw the papaya in there, you know, because, uh, most of the people making hash with the papaya, you know, um, it's, uh, through like, you know, Poochie, you know, gave it to like Bloom Seed Company. I guess now it's starting to spread and a lot of other breeders have it, but, um, you know, I yeah, got that's that. That's cool, man. Like you said, I'm, I'm actually kind of excited to see like what comes of it because like you said, you are mixing uh, a modern quote unquote hash hybrid and then uh, with a more like traditional hash plant, you know, so it'll be cool to see what people find in there. Yeah, I, I so like I did, you know, with the BX2 outcrosses, I, I did a lot more than I did with the BX1. And um, I crossed it to a lot of stuff that I think uh, potentially will have the, the right type of uh, calyxes to have really good hash yields, you know? Because um, I just, you know, like I said, it, 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 it's basically a pure line at that, that point. And um, just outcrossing to other lines, it, it just really... It, I saw it clicking well, so I wanted to, to, to experiment with a whole bunch of other strains, and I actually crossed the BX2 to probably about close to 20 cuts, and it's going to take me a long time to test them all, because I can only grow about five at a time to test them out, you know, because I like to look at a, a, a good number of, you know, 
those five. So, and then when it comes to carrying and processing and shit, it's just, I can't do, you know, it's just fucking overwhelming. What's your ideal sample size on the, on those five varieties? Say what? Uh, your ideal sample size on those five varieties that you're running at the same time? 20 females. I like to look through about 20 females. Yeah. Um, so that'll give me a good, uh, estimate on what's coming in in the gene pool you know because if you just have a couple that's not a big enough uh base you don't know what's going on because you could just get lucky or unlucky and it could totally not show you what is the average you know so at what, at what point does fragrance and aroma come into play because i know you said your basis is, is pretty much the medicinal and the um kind of uh the strength and the effect of things is basically what you're going for um but with you know flavor and aromas and fragrances obviously inevitably come with that um yeah that what, when, gonna... yeah is it like not even at smoking it but where in its growth really are you the plant's growth are you kind of feeling out the fragrance and aroma i guess is my question so like when i meant like i'm not worried about fragrance and aroma i'm not i meant like i'm not doing um you know, like these modern ha hash breeders, you know, that's what they're really focused on, taking shit to next levels and stuff like that. Um, what I'm working on is uh, getting stuff in the seed form and having it be as quality and under the same quality as the original clones I was working on, you know, and um, I like to like grow the clone out, you know, and, um, you know, like, you know, if I'm doing the, the puck project, for example, you know, um, you know, I'm going to grow the pure puck and I'm going to be able to, to, to grow, uh, you know, those BX2s and I'll harvest a, a good number of them and compare them to the original clone. And I'll be able to see, you know, are they uh, passing the same terpenes and um, medical effects on, you know, is it just as good as, is it better? You know, that type of thing. Um, that's the reason I'm doing all those uh strains i'm about to harvest in the next few days i'm harvesting all the strains that i'm going to be testing you know I'm like both i'm harvesting both sensi stars i'm harvesting the garlic bud i'm harvesting the skunk from wick and um those are all the things that i'm testing so i'll have them in, in flower form to be able to test against the, the crosses to see if they're uh, good enough to release you know and um that's really where i'm at you know and I want the terpenes to match the clone, you know, I want them to be just as loud and I want to, because that's where the medical uh, benefits are coming from, you know, it's definitely the terpenes, you know, and um, that's why I'm just, I try to, you know, work with the original males that are as pure as possible or closely related to the, the females to help preserve those rather than to mix stuff to make new amazing stuff you know that i mean that's an amazing thing you know to do and that's kind of like what the f1 of the papaya by the puck does you know but i'm not going to take that and work that further i'm just you know that's i'm just going to put that out there and if someone wants to work it further or whatever they can you know um, but i feel like uh you know, my mission with what I have genetically and what I'm interested in is just to, to preserve stuff as, as, as close as po possible. Like I'm also working on a OG Kush project right now. You know, I wish, took the M10 Afghani number one across to the Triangle Kush. And then I've uh, back crossed it now on the OG Kush. And I also took the um tk m10 og and across it to all the other g cush cuts i have you know like just uh keep it you know as tight as possible and see which uh ones are uh, gonna be the way i'm gonna work that line in the future you know because i crossed it to the og cush uh, some people refer to it as the 92 it's just to me, it's just OG Kush. It's the one that was brought out from Florida. And then uh, when it was brought out, it was Kush. And then it got the OG name in LA, you know, when, um, you know, the guys were getting it to Cypress Hill, you know, and those guys and all, all the rappers wanted to smoke it. And um, 
So, so just, in that sense, that Kush is kind of the same one for you that kind of went around and just got almost renamed. It definitely got renamed. It also made a lot of S1 seeds. And a lot of people got back seats and popped them up. Um, you know, that. You educate us between an F1 and an S1, because you brought both terms up and it's, we kind of do like educational kind of thing, I guess you could say, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. So um, an S1 is a strain bred back to itself. It can either happen on purpose, you know, if you're spraying some shit on it, or it can just happen in the grow room environment, you know, being too close to the lights is something that will cause so many strains to do it. Um, feeding too hard, too hot, too much nutrients will cause some of these strains to do it. And um, when people are running production, you know, they're running, you know, 10, 20, 30 lights back in the day. And it's all one strain most of the time because, uh, you know, that's what you're running. That's what the people wanted. And, um, you know, shit would, you know, make a few seeds here and then and people would get them. And that's where a lot of the OGs came from and then just got uh, renamed. I, I have, a, you know, I'm pretty sure that the 92, um, the one that got named OG Kush is just the same one that people call the ghost, you know. It went to, uh, from Josh D to Oregon kid and then Oregon kid uh, sold it to ghost a guy on overgrow and um he started circulating it around um he had a few different ogs and a lot of people said you know that that could be where a lot of the confusion comes from is you know he was given a few different people uh, different cuts i don't know um if that's true or not um but i do know for a fact that there was a lot of ass one bag seeds popped in in la region and they were uh renamed and stuff um so. Is there, I was curious while we're on the topic of kush uh i was told like you know out in the field being shown different plants at one point in time that the kushes are a always a wider leaf uh family is that always true like is there always going to be a is the kush always going to have a wider family is that something that so that that is um true but um there's so the og kush and the triangle kush um are probably an afghani from the hindu kush if i had to guess but they are quite different than your average kush strain like man Something like spacing. You're cutting out. For us. No time. That sucks. Um, I think masters, master Kush is where you cut out there. Okay, so the master Kush and OG Kush are are, are different. Um, different plants. Um. When people speak of uh, a traditional Kush plant, it's a very short, tight, internodal plant that's you know not much taller than three to five feet tall. OG Kush is a uh, you know a bag seed that came out of Florida. Um, Matt B was you know grew out his bag seed, and uh, from what I I know, his older brother saw it and was like, "This is Kush." Um, just because they he had seen the flannish flower and it was a round, dense nugget. Um, I think OG Kush probably is another Afghani, but you know that's another uh, reason. You know you can't be doing pedigrees on these things. It's a giant can of worms on the origins of every single cannabis uh, genetic that's really good. You know, if I had to guess, I would say uh, OG Kush goes back to Northern Lights. You know. But that's just a guess. And um, who knows, you know, really. Um, what I was going to ask about those seeds, though, is like, is there any difference in the in the quality? Maybe not the quality, but like the quote unquote stability in regards to like hermaphrodite 
type traits in between the F1 seeds or the S1 seeds? Is there any difference? So like I crossed it to um, the Afghani one to the TK and then I, I crossed it to the OG Kush. And then when I did that breeding, I also crossed it, you know, I did the back cross with the OG Kush and then I hit it to the uncirculated OG, the headband, um, the cut I've been holding forever, which is a renamed OG. Um, and um, so I'm going to be able to grow those all out, you know, and it, once I grow those out and um, test them all against each other and, and, and see, I'll, I'll know a lot more about, you know, what's going on every time I grow uh, and test stuff out like this, especially when I keep it tight in the family like that, I learn a lot and I'm real excited to get in into that project because I know uh, it's going to be really exciting for me. I love OG Kush. I love headband. I love triangle Kush. They're all some of my favorites to smoke in um I know the OG TKM10 was really good and um, I was extremely happy with that. So I'm really excited to see this next generation. Um, I'll, I'll know a lot more about what's going on in the family after I, I finish that project, I feel like. Cool. Um, so I, I don't mean to kind of go back, but going back to the question of breeding uh, and just like a simple, terms like what what is breeding to you uh whether it's cannabis related or not i guess you know to me uh breeding is uh for preservation to uh preserve the qualities of uh these clones you know and to get them in the seed form so that uh other people can experience these special things and in, in seed form and have it be as close to the original you know, um, with the same type of medical qualities and, and growth patterns and terpenes as the clones have themselves. That's what it is to me. Um, you know, every breeder is going to look at it different, you know. Um, some breeders are, you know, doing things completely different, trying to um, not make it as, they're trying to make it better, you know, and that's you know i i definitely try to do that but i i want to keep it the same and i feel like the real way to make cannabis better than it is now is to be crossing different lines and really looking through huge populations you know and i'm just trying to be one of the people that's uh providing ammunition for uh the people that are going to be able to do that you know and uh to get all these old people like me uh, that used to smoke these uh, varieties that want to be able to experience them again and grow them for themselves now that you know their state is becoming legal or whatever you know um, and provide that to them that's what breeding is for me and regarding the traits you you brought up the importance of having these almost like as pure males as you can how do you see the characteristics coming uh, into these hybrids that you're creating? Like, is there a percentage that's coming from a certain, uh, the mother and, and then the father, or how do you look at that at, while you're breeding? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So like when, when I decide a cross is something that I would want to take back and start a back cross on, I've grown out the, the F1, you know, and the family was pretty uniform, generally, all the ones I, I chose to, to work with, you know? Um, so that's really what I chose, because, you know, like, you know, the train wreck back cross, I used the A5 Haze tie, you know, and I feel like when I grew those out, they were all, you know, they all had that terpenaline, you know, from the haze and from the tie and from the, um, that side. And then the train wreck's got, you know, the same qualities. It's got a little bit more uh, uniqueness to it. But um, it was very similar, you know. There was, it was just like one type of cannabis, you know. It wasn't like crossing um, the puck hash plant to the train wreck, which I just did, you know. I just did that just for fun because I feel like that'll produce a plant that is going to have some terpenes that are going to be uh from the puck and 
be dominated by the train wreck terpenes, but it, the puck should have a lot better structure, you know? But that's when those are grown out, the train wreck's going to dominate, but there's there are going to be two or three different phenos you're going to see. That's not going to be like A5 Hayes tied train wreck cross where they were all just sativa dominate plants with, uh, you know, terpenaline and, and, and stuff like that really thick in, uh, um, you know, the A5 Hayes, you know, um, added, added some of the leathery garlic terps, which I thought were really nice um, to that. But besides that, it was all just pretty uniform terpenaline, you know. And um, that's where, I, you know, I tried to do my back cross project off of uh, is, is stuff that I've grown out the F1s. And they're just pretty much one type of cannabis involved. And, um, it clicked well and it represented itself well, you know, um, growing, um, <clears throat> out some Pacific Northwest BX2 right now. And that was just off the NL1. I've crossed that uh, back in the Pacific Northwest, uh, three times now for the BX2. And, um, you know, I used that, the NL1 Pacific Northwest male for the puck back cross. I used the Kabul Kush for the Master Kush project. Uh, the Kabul Kush came from friend of Tim Blake's that um, he introduced to Kegu because he had some Afghani that his son-in-law had brought back. Um, and, um, you know, Tim Blake knew Kegu was the man that was uh, going to you know, preserve the line and keg you gave them to me and I turned, you know, a few seats into a few thousand and um we gave them back to the original guy and uh, I, I wasn't there but uh keg you I'll, I'll never forget him saying the guy was just like holy shit this is a lot of seats <laughs> uh keg you was that's what we do <laughs> you know and um so yeah you know that was just like the guy had a few seeds that were about to get too old and you know not be good anymore and we refreshed them up and gave them you know thousands back you know so that that line will get preserved and at the same time i, I crossed it to the master kush you know and a few other cushions like the purple hindu kush and i found that that line was really good breeding stock too and um you know i back crossed the purple hindu kush off of that and i've also back crossed the the master kush off of that and um just is there some strains uh that uh just you know cross well you know I, and when you find a strain that, that that crosses well you know use it that like i wasn't the first person to find out the afghani on F m10 you know was a, a great cross strain or the northern lights you know i'm just following history you know and um, I just know what uh, has been created from Northern Lights and Afghani number one. So those are two of my biggest staples for uh, starting these back cross lines off of on the Indica side. Yeah, so, and then, uh, so based uh, on what you've said, like you obviously, some of the lines you work a lot um, and then in other cases, like for example, the offshoot of that that papaya one that you talked about, you won't work, for example, but your style seems to be more like working these lines. And then I think I heard you say something on the podcast that was like people who are growing seeds are, are typically looking for, you know, stuff that is pretty all similar, that whole population is. And I feel like uh, in the case of at least hash processors or people that are focused on that it's almost kind of like the opposite people don't people want this kind of variation uh but i feel like it's almost like a different kind of variation because it's still part of that closed in gene pool it's more like of an instability issue uh so i'm curious like your thoughts on working lines and then uh or not working them and then the idea of like people looking for, for unique things within gene pools that are pretty kind of muddied up. 
Yeah, I mean, so like everybody has a different best cannabis plant. You know, like what is the best type of cannabis? You ask, you know, 20 people and 20 people are going to tw- tell you 20 different things. You know, you, you ask somebody that likes to roll joints and then uh, you ask somebody that likes to take dabs and then you ask someone that likes to take bong hits and, uh, you know, smoking different ways you know different cannabis uh you know things work out better like there's some types of cannabis you know like that will smoke good as fuck all the way down to the roach on a joint you know even that last fucking hit is fucking bomb as shit you know like uk cheese is one of the old school staples that you know was like that you know um and then you know there's these modern people that like to take dabs and um you know like they like to smoke, you know, papaya, the, um, you know, I feel like, you know, what <clears throat> Oni did and, you know, Bloom Seed Company, Harry Palms, you know, is a uh, foundation for a lot of people that are uh, making really good, uh, you know, fucking hash, modern hash plant crosses, you know, and um, so it's like, you know, those are the, you know, you know, I, I gave uh, Poochie that banana OG for a Twix bar at, at the High Times Cup because, you know, he was, I knew he was, you know, a cool kid at that point. That was in like 2014. And he just didn't have anything worth trading. So um, it was really cool to see that, you know, he passed out the Harry Palms and all the breedings they did with that, you know, and um, like, you know, I feel like, uh, you know, like those are, you know, like huge on uh, making hash, you know, and then also, uh, you know, the GMO is huge too because of, you know, the, the yields it produces, you know, so. Um, is the GMO to you like reminiscent because you've talked about uh, the garlic bud, and you've mentioned like some crosses that you have currently that have uh, some garlic in it. Is the GMO reminiscent to you of that? Kind of as a side note. <laughs> yeah, you know, that, that's very interesting. And a lot of people ask me that and are interested in that. And, um, you know, the GMO is really good. I really like it. And um, it's not something I wanted to get to breed with, you know. I'm, um, I think, you know, it's a really good plant and a lot of breeders have worked with it and it's not something I, I, I need to get, you know, to work with. Um, there's a lot of different, you know, uh, you know, like when I describe the puck, I, I describe it as garlic and a lot of people um instantly ask hey is that like the gmo and i'm like no it's more like you know a skunky garlic bread garlic you know it's a it's a different note of garlic and um that's more like what that garlic bud is too you know just like that old school shit um garlic bud uh was renamed uh, Shiva Shante when Ben Donkers bought it from Neville, you know, because I thought it was a better marketing name than garlic. Because um, back then in the Amsterdam, especially, people were way more interested in the fruitier notes than they were these um, notes that were more raunchy, the, the stuff that made OG Kush, the stuff that made Chemdog, and, you know, a lot of the stuff that, um, you know, smokers in america find to be the best things you know they they were uh, not really into them you know um so. i have a question on um just have you ever like what is the story on headband do you even know it no worries if you don't but to me it's like you're wearing a headband and it's a sweaty headband and now you have like a sweaty smell in there maybe those are some flavor notes like a body odor funk thing going on with those kinds of things do you ever get that headband thing almost like gmo but not anywhere near as like raunchy but it's definitely a maybe considered kind of like that the headband um 
I know there's multiple, yeah, but yeah. anyways. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure since, uh, you, you know, in circles you've mentioned, you've seen my headband cut, um, like Not So Dog tagged it as the 56 day headband. Um, so that's a cut that was, you know, I've been holding forever and um, it was a renamed OG, you know, and it needed to be renamed. It wasn't just a, they were told to rename it, you know, and um, they're all sitting around smoking it one day and they felt the headband, you know, on the head. And, um, you know, I do feel that occasionally with that strain, but um, it doesn't really do it to me every time, you know, um, it, to me, it just relaxes my, my muscles, you know, especially, uh, you know, every, every muscle in my body, you know, it, it's, it's just like, um, I remember back in the day, a lot of people in in, in Arcata, McKinley area would call it uh, paranoia in a bong hit, you know, because, um, <laughs> you know, it just, uh, it, it's a strong one. I used to grow it forever for, uh, you know, um, it was my uh, work strain and um, I used to be, you know, like tell anyone and everyone, I was just like, please show me something better, you know, like in Arcata and Humble, you know back in the day and everyone pr pretty much can see that that was the best you know that was the uh the strain that those uh rappers bob and two chains uh made that headband song off of they used to like to get that um i gave the headband cut to one of the original four-way guys and he was the one that was uh shooting that over to them and uh yeah to me it's some of the best cannabis in the world you know and um there it's just a renamed og and there's a lot of confusion with headband because there's so many different headbands there's uh weasels uh diesel original diesel headband which was chem 91 cross or bag seed depending upon who you talk to and then um dna did a headband that they released that uh was uh like og kush uh sour diesel type of thing you know so they sold seeds of that so um, the headband it's another one that's uh tons of confusion but the cut i hold is uh, just a a renamed og and um i've heard a few two different backstories on what it is exactly and i'm not going to get into either one of them it's a can of worms and it says you know somebody else's story to tell it's it's not mine i just have been the one that's been holding on to it and keeping it alive and passing it back to people for a long time hey i'm going to quote uh, mr bob Hempill: people tell stories and plants tell the truth so mm -hmm. there's uh totally understandable why we can't you know shouldn't get into these but um you know you've mentioned the cuts uh obviously it's been like a, a big point of our conversation one of your nicknames is the librarian how do you keep cuts around healthy alive and good enough to create seed stock so long um crazy <laughs> you know i i, I you know, I can go camping for a few days, you know, but that's about it. You know, I never go on vacations, you know. Uh, I haven't been back to Northern Virginia to see my family in forever, you know. Like in the last 20 years, I've been back for like 10 years ago, I went for sister's wedding. And like 20 years ago, I went for my mom's funeral, you know. And um, I've, you know, huge sacrifices, you know, <laughs> is basically it you know huge sacrifices and um it's cool that it's all making sense now you know with just the sacrifices and um all the work and because getting it in the seed form it's all making sense to me now it's like uh, oh yeah it's all okay um but yeah that almost been like a you know like a cat hoarder you know <laughs> just uh, like i gotta rescue them and it's like on me you know a lot of pressure a lot of stress um you know it's uh 
watering them every day no holidays they don't care about birthdays they don't care about fucking holidays one bit you know um it's, it's commitment and um they wouldn't be here without hannibal you know and because there have been a few times where i've been like oh fuck it you know i'm just cutting back to three or four and then she'll be like no no don't do it and then there'll be times where she'll be like oh let's just cut back to a few and i'll be like no 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 so um we're like a good team you know like um and uh both of us have you know had huge sacrifices for this shit you know we used to have fucking bedroom in our fucking bedroom you know and had the fucking lights going in the fucking night you know you can block it by a tent but it's still fucking annoying or whatever and um you know like she drove those suckers out to Colorado and shit, you know, <laughs> fucking savagely, you know, and um, just the how how do we have them? It's, it's a dedication, you know, um, you know, when I, I first got PM, you know, uh, I ended up killing off a few ones, um, but we kept most of them, you know, and uh, I'm talking when I first got PM, like early 2000s when everyone first got it because it wasn't around before then it just circulated like wildfire and uh, you know just had to figure out how to get rid of it you know and i got rid of it by outrunning it and treating the you know things that were antifungal you know like neem or sulfur and uh, essential oils and outrunning it and then you know I had to do the same shit with fucking Micromites when they came around, man. The broads and the russets, man, because those those suckers didn't come around until about 2010 to 2014. And then instead of, you know, like when all my shit got powdery mildew and broad mites, I didn't just say fuck it and throw it all away. You know, I just fucking worked my ass off on how to, you know, clean shit up. And, you know, I've gone over that in the, in the podcast and shit. You know, if you want to figure that out, you listen to those. But, uh, you know, it's just the commitment, you know, um, it's just like, uh, I know if I'm not going to do it. No one else is going to do it, you know, and that's, uh, you know, how, you know, some of my friends started joking about me with the library and shit, you know, like you, even, all, you know, like my good friends, they don't know exactly what the whole fucking library, they're all like, you know, what's all, all up in that fucking library, you know, um, <laughs> So, like, you know, it's just dedication and um, being on point, you know, with your shit. You know, you can't let them slack off, man. Because some of these old moms that are a bitch to keep around and a bitch to root. And if you let them get all unhealthy and you slack on them, then they're going to be a fucking pain in the ass. You're going to have to get them into a perfect environment. And then further feed the shit out of them to get them back to health. So it's just way easier to keep them healthy than uh, provide that perfect environment for a large amount of mothers, you know? So I like to circulate them out quick, you know? I take cuttings off the plants when they're small and uh, healthy still, you know? And um, I'm taking cuts, you know, probably every six weeks. Uh, I take another round of mothers, you know? They're much easier to maintain when they're small, you know. Um, fucking California power is fucking insane. Everything's insane out here now. Um, but, you know, uh, just trying to um, find a balance between keeping them healthy and then, you know, not fucking killing myself on power bill. It's, you know, what I found out, it's best to just keep them small and take cuts off them quick. That's what works for me. Um, if I could, I have a quick question. Um, I guess I need to learn how to ask it properly. It's a, probably a bit more basic than I'm trying. When was the first time that you ever saw bubble hash? I'm trying to get like a hash history question out there. Yeah, yeah. Um, great, great. Cause you know, as I said, we are big hash uh, fans, obviously. Um, yeah, what is your your personal perspective on all that? Maybe it was at a show or something, because that was the first time I saw it. 
anyway. So the first time I saw oil was 95 when Jerry Garcia was still alive in Philadelphia. We got oil and it came from Jamaica. Okay, they were making hash oil down in Jamaica. That's the first place that I had seen oil and it was coming out of Jamaica all through the 90s. And um, I'm not exactly sure how they were making it, you know? It just came in these little vials and you'd like stick like uh, what we would do, like a, a, a paper clip down it and then drip it on a bowl and smoke it. That's how we were doing it back then, you know? And then a few years later, you started seeing uh, the bubble hash, you know? And then um, people always used to make, you know, scissor hash, you know, and um, trim hash, you'd let the fucking alcohol dry out for like a month until there was no alcohol left in there and smoke that at the bottom of the jars. I was never really super into that. I did like to keef stuff back in the day and we were keefing in 94, 95 with silk screens. And then uh, we could press that into a little blonde hash. Um, so have you guys ever heard of a paddle? I don't think so. I, are you, you're muted, Adam. Uh, like a paddle for washing? So or rowing a boat? Yeah, exactly. So um, I have a friend that's a glass dealer and um, he was friends with all, you know, Snodgrass and Bob Batchum and all of them. And in the late 90s, uh, he's a heavy fucking smoker and uh, we'll go, we'll call him Larry Nunya. Um, that's his nickname. That's not his real name. Uh, so Larry Nunya fucking was like, oh, you guys ready to fucking get your ass smacked? And this is like 98, 99. And he breaks out this fucking thing. And it's a glass rod with a, a flat, flattened out thing that, um, was the paddle and you would take a blowtorch to the paddle and you would heat the it was like a knife hit you know because we were doing knife hits in the 90s where you take two knives and you fucking get them red hot on the stove and then you'd fucking press the knives in between the hash and those were knife hits you know that was uh we used to do that in the 90s and that was you know it was nasty because the shit was red hot and fucking the metal you know it's just fucking nasty so this paddle shit was like fucking you know, those glass blown crews were like, oh, yeah, we're going to fucking make some glass fucking nice, basically, is what it was. You know, it's a flat paddle. You blow torch that thing red hot and you drop a piece of hash on it. And they made these fucking bongs. Um, Bob Batchum did. And um, they had open bottoms. So you put that right over the paddle and it would suck up through and there'd be filtration in the middle. Um, so, you know, it, was, it filtered like a bong, but that was just in the middle of the thing. It wasn't like the, yeah, the that's whole. Cool, man. And those were paddles. And um, yeah, that, that shit fucking was the first time that, you know, like I got to smoke hash where you just got fucking wasted like you can off of dabs now, you know, like that shit would shut motherfuckers down, you know? Those like, are the first dabs, pretty much. Or, like, you know... Yeah, I mean, it, it depends on... I think, I mean, is a knife hit a dab, you know? <laughs> right, yeah, just, you're right. Yeah. Long, long before me, you know, and um, they're probably just doing... Just an evolution things. of the surface, you know? I like, the, thing that the surfaces and materials the evolve. Is the, the, the inclusion of the glass. Like, them starting to encase it's for you to be able to take that hit it through the glass from the knife things that they made from glass purposely. Like that's where I feel like it starts becoming more of like the thing that it's become or becoming now or whatever. 100% agree did... with. Sorry. But no, I just 100% agree with that. And I was actually thinking about the paddles uh, just recently, you know, and um it's you know I had no there was clue a little that. swing to them right like I forget At, what they call them I... yeah there was um you know like you would have one rod and it was like flat and it had like a little place where you could stick the hash bowl in it you know 
And then you had another rod that was, um, had like a ball on the end that you would heat really hot and you would stick that onto the paddle. And so it took two people, you know, cause one person was the one that was holding the bong and then there was the other person that got it all hot for him, you know? I wonder what kind of metal that was. Uh, it was all glass on glass. That, uh, oh, the, the glass was a paddle. I see. Yeah, yeah. Because there was it was all glass on glass, glass. and um, you would just heat up the glass rods with the uh, blowtorch. I have one of those. I, and, I actually, um, I, I can. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. That was the the first time that it tasted really good because the, the hot metal knife hits were fucking awful, and you know, and so. No, well, cool, yeah. man. I appreciate you sharing that. That's actually a pretty uh, a cool story. I don't, I don't think that I've ever heard of uh, a paddle, to be honest with you. Like I said, yeah, um, yeah. It, it was about two thousand and three and two thousand and four when everyone started going crazy with the bubble bags and Arcata and shit. You know, like people actually started looking at the trim to make money rather than it just was something to make ganja food with. You know. I remember people getting, you know, like those warehouses on the north side of Arcata and places like that just to fucking make hash in, you know? And they'd have these things where they have racks to hold the bags because those fuckers are so heavy, you know, especially when they're running through bulk amounts. And that's really when hash culture started really taking off, you know? Yeah, that's cool. And Adam, funny enough, you got in there to the area a little after that. And then, yeah, I'll, I'll send you a video because, like, from where you talked, I didn't realize it was glass on glass. I have, I don't probably don't have it anymore, but I posted on Instagram back in like 2013 or something. And it's like a, a, a glass um, paddle and it has a little thing and you can smoke from it. Um, you have to heat up a wand though, too. So I think it's a similar thing that you're talking about. But, anyways. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Um, 2003, 2004, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um. Well, cool, man. I appreciate you hanging out with us this long. Um, we'll start kind of winding it down. Adam, do you have any questions that you wanted to ask? Um, I think that, like, we touched on a lot of things that I wanted to talk about. I, I think that one thing I will do just quickly, if you can, and if not, no problem, because we did talk a lot about these quote unquote throwback um things like a headband gdp things that maybe you um are stoked to see come out but could you name maybe a, a couple different ones that maybe we did we didn't talk about or something that 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 you'd like to see i have this like um fantasy of creating a bunch of hash that are based off of these throwbacks that i liked and that other people liked um like that so I don't know. Yeah, just uh. So um, also worked a tangerine skunk um into a BX one this summer. That's a you know from Oregon kid brought that one to the community. It's you know possibly like you know close to forty years old at this point. Um, the only thing I know that it goes back to is a uh, Salmon Creek Big Bud. You know, um, just really one of the most flavorful uh, cannabis is uh you know you can imagine you know and then um flowers are out to about 77 days with huge really potent buds lots of times when you get the citrus um terps the weed doesn't get you very high you know and the tangerine skunks the complete package you know and um so I got that one at a BX1. I'm, you know, pretty excited about that. And, um, you know, I got a, that purple Hindu Kush back crossed it off of the uh, M10. And um, I'm growing those out now. And I also crossed it to the Urkel and the Granddaddy Purple. And, um, you know, those, those two right there, I feel like are just really really good cannabis especially painkillers you know and um a lot of people uh you know wouldn't have you know access to them uh if it wasn't for csi providing those uh crosses to the to the market you know and um 
those uh, strains I feel like are behind uh, cookies. You know, I feel like it's them crossed with an Afghani and an OG is basically what makes up cookies, you know? And, um, Oh, you know, excited to be working. I'm going to find out what, you know, what works best with those uh, strains to eventually work them into pure form, you know, the Urkel and the granddaddy, you know, um, I think they're really uh, special, unique uh, Afghanis um, that were preserved in Humboldt, you know, and you know, there's a rumor that Urkel goes back to Skunk One. And, you know, I'm, I'm not going to believe that for a second. You know, I've just grown too many crosses and I've grown too much Skunk One crosses and grown too many Urkel crosses to, to, to see any um, similar arities and terpenes in there. So um, I just think it's an old heirloom, you know, Afghani and Humboldt type of, you know. I, I, I almost forgot to talk about this. This was something kind of exciting that that um, whatever got announced on Hash Church. The most recent episode I was watching, Turp Wizard got D and Pure certified, and I was stoked. I put that on. It came up on my YouTube, and I um, just so happened to come up upon when um, Skunk Man Sam. Uh, I think I think it's like in the plant science plant botany the botany world it's already a known thing with other plants um and of course we've you've you know people um i guess what they're doing is changing the females into males or sorry changing the, the males into females and then um I'm not a great vessel of knowledge on this shragam do you know anything more about this i know that it's bringing out different things that you wouldn't have to do quite as much work for you. You see different um, traits, maybe, and uh, without a doubt, um, expression so that way. See with the male, uh, it looks like in a female expression. You know, um, people have been doing that for a while. Um, it's not something I'm really into. Um, you know, you're definitely not going to be uh, DEM certified if you're doing that. You know, you don't do that with uh, organic substances. Um, so, you know, I'm not really into spraying shit like that, you know, I'll do it the hard knocks way, you know, and sometimes, you know, my, my projects fucking turn into bird feed, you know, um, but I'm sure the people that are reversing their males, sometimes their projects are bird feed too, you know, and just because you're reversing your males uh, and smelling them doesn't mean you're smoking them because I've heard, talked to a few of these people that reverse them and they don't smoke them, they just get to smell them, you know, and when I'm smelling plants, they fucking can smell great, but it's like when they cure and dry, what they taste like and smoke like then is what is important. It doesn't matter what they smell like when they're growing and vegging, you know, and um, flowering, you know, it's, it's the dried flower that is the important aspect um, for me, you know, for, that's what I look for, you know, that's where, what I judge off of. And so, you know, I wouldn't want to spray those chemicals. I definitely wouldn't want to smoke weed with them on. I've always been organic. I've never sprayed Avid or fucking any pesticides on my shit. You know, um, I've always been an organic farmer. And, uh, I, you know, I believe in uh, organic practices, you know. And um, I just like to do things naturally, you know. And I, I feel like uh, when I uh, think about it ahead of time and I match the males up and with something i'm doing a pretty good job of uh figuring out what the hell is going to go on with the project especially when i'm familiar with both lines and um you know i'm very familiar with a lot of these clones have been growing in forever yeah i don't know i don't know anything about really what adam what you brought up uh except for i think kind of the unique the maybe twist here was that the guy was smoking uh the product uh and it's some i don't know maybe type of ethanol no. or something i'm pretty You're not I smoking spoke to, i spoke to turp wizard and he told he said that basically the guy is it's some kind of ethanol that's like it's okay enough for him to smoke or something in this case but no i think that 
maybe or whatever i maybe i'm confused but what what you're doing is you're spraying something on the plant and it's changing it into having different female traits that you can kind of be get visuals on and cues for what you kind of want to put into your intention into your seed project a little bit for it and it's not it's not that you get to smoke the different varieties or whatever it's not anything like that um it's literally just like what you what expressions you get to see and maybe smell um and that is as little as I know, but maybe I didn't listen to enough of that to be a good vessel. Of, again, I'm not being a good vessel of knowledge on this subject, but I think that he was familiar with um, with yeah. it previously too. So, um, yeah, there's a, a, definitely another topic that I forgot about that I would want to wind the thing down. But let's just free ball. I'd do whatever you want, Shragam. I don't know. Maybe it'll come up. Maybe it won't. Well, my last question uh, for you is we talked a little bit about, or you brought up uh, coastal seeds. Uh, I know you talked about it a good amount on the podcast and you brought up KG1. And I, I'm curious, like overall from that experience, what was your biggest takeaway? The, the biggest takeaway was to uh, make it in on the focus for uh, getting these lines pure and, and the preservation aspect. That is like, huge you know um that's where i got on this mission you know i wasn't on this mission before then and i'm i'm on it now like fully dedicated that's you know i've been doing that's all i've been doing since i left and i'm um, focusing 110 percent on it and um you know for that you know helping me direct what i've been doing you know this time is you know i'm very grateful the BAM and, and the KQ and you know Bamboo is coming up tonight he did he just texted me a few minutes ago uh when we were to, in an interview so um you know it's well, just I'm stoked, uh, to, I'm stoked to meet you guys and hang out we're, we're for those who don't know and who are listening there's a tending the garden um showing today in Arcata and it's really exciting because uh two wonderful folks made this film and they're bringing the community together. I remember the topic that I wanted to talk about. If it's too long and expanding and you don't, you know, we don't have time, it's fine. But basically, if I can get the gist out is like, there's so much, there's a dynamic nature to cannabis in general, meaning there's all these different genetic expressions and, and in a sense, potential in, in seeds and things that have been in the past. So like, is it really that we've done so much work to make cannabis better or I, I guess, have I explained enough for you to maybe just talk about what your, your opinion on all that? 110%. Um, that's why I don't, you know, that's why I say I'm into preservation and not a, a cannabis breeder. There's very few people that I look at um, what, they've done and i have huge respect for it you know like i have huge respect for what neville did you know and um you know i feel like uh you know people have fucked up cannabis a lot you know um i feel like a lot of the the weed that i feel like are the best clones in the whole world are clones from the early 90s and stuff you know like it doesn't get better than the original OGs or chem dogs and headband and sour diesel, you know, like I think, you know, I don't think any of these stuff are, are better than that, you know? So I really think at some point in the future, um, you know, there'll be a lot more work done on cannabis, you know? Um, You know, like, you know, I'm hard knocks, you know, learned everything, you know, myself type of thing. Uh, I feel like, you know, um, with testing and education and stuff um, and the knowledge of, you know, like what people I have that, you know, what the plant should be like, you know, I think that's the requirements that are going to take it to the next level, you know, Um I think what's going to, what's basically, there was a golden age in um, 
Amsterdam for campus breeding. And that was the late 80s and early 90s. And then it all went to hell by 2000. And then right around 2000 is when a few uh, people like Top Dog um, really stepped up and uh, brought the flame back to America, you know? And that was really the, 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 the point where America started to have the best genetics in the world again. Because everything that came to Amsterdam, most of it came from California or at least the West Coast. And, um, you know, right around 2000 to 2010 is when so many people in America started breeding. There was like so many more breeders because around 2000 there was like hardly any people breeding cannabis and um you know I, there were people breeding cannabis that but there weren't people making seeds available you know like i had been breeding since the mid-90s myself but never ever thought about making a seed company you know um, that thought never even passed through my mind why would i want to sell seeds when i can sell flowers you know <laughs> and then as flower prices started to drop, you know, and right around 2000, that's when a lot of people started to get into, to, to, into the seed game, you know, and some of these uh, people got into it for the right reasons, you know, like Top Dog is one of the few people that I, I look up to, like Neville, you know, like JJ uh, started his breeding program because he wanted to preserve the chem qualities and he wanted to have it in seed form basically the same shit that i'm doing with these lines he wanted to because he knew clones were hard to keep then he started passing those seeds around to people people started freaking the fuck out and that's how you know top dog came about you know um so like that is one of you know the breeders that you know, I, I respect, you know, there was some of the other breeders that jumped on the wagon early were just people that couldn't grow cannabis. They couldn't even grow good flowers. So they realized, hey, I can make seeds and seeds are worth money. You know, I'm not going to throw anybody under the bus, but they know who they are. Yeah, that's pretty funny. I never really looked at it that way. But yeah, interesting. I, it always trips me out that thing where like, Amsterdam was a spot for a while, but a lot of the genetics they were working with, like you said, had come from here. And I guess others were probably, you know, stuff that they were bringing in from other places like land races, maybe. Uh, and then the scene kind of shifted back here. Yeah, without a doubt. Um, you know, definitely America is the, the forefront on cannabis breeding once again. And then it's cool. And, um, you know, now that it's becoming legal in all states and if it becomes, you know, federally legal, you know, what's going to happen is going to be even more. So, you know, so like, I feel like the best, uh, you know, golden era of cannabis breeding is hopefully, you know, in the future, you know, um, just as long as we fucking keep the good, you know, shit away from the chats, you know, and, that comes down to the consumers, you know, like where you spend your fucking money, you know, don't support those fucking Chad companies, you know, support the people that have uh, been working with the plant for a long time, you know, you know, fucking people that decided that, they, you know, they want to work with cops and shit like that, you know, that's some fucking whack shit, you know, that's not how we did it back in the day. Um. I feel like, you know, if the consumers are educated and they uh, support the right brands and stuff, uh, you know, the fucking, the sky's the limit with cannabis in the future, you know? If uh, people get uneducated and it just turns into fucking commercial crap, you know? Hopefully that doesn't happen, you know? Because, you know, there's two ways this, you know, legalization has, is going right now, you know? And, um there's some people that are doing it for you know different reasons than others you know so it's important that we uh keep the old school vibes alive the old school community standards you know you don't work with fucking cops you don't work with fucking rats and uh 
you know, it's kind, bud, you know, be nice to each other. Yeah, man. Well, again, man, we really appreciate you hanging out. Um, and we'll let you get back to the garden. I'm sure you got stuff to do. Again, if you want to follow Mr. Bob Hemphill on Instagram, you can do it at Mr. Bob Hemphill or at Cricket and Cicada Seeds. Uh, anything else you want to say before we sign off, man? Thanks a lot for having me. And uh, I couldn't do it without Hannibal. Uh, yeah, not to Hannibal. We uh, that was a whole topic I was going to bring up, but I feel like we've kind of run run long. But uh, yeah, maybe we could even like have her on someday if she's open to it uh, or something. That'd be cool. Yeah, she and doesn't like this, but uh, <laughs> fair. Totally. What are the cactuses behind you? Uh, um, Pacanoi, San Pedro's. Man, those are pretty tall. Or maybe you're sitting down. Uh, I'm standing up. I got some tall ones, you know. Dude, those one. are tight. Wow. One taller than me. Um, Crazy. Anyways, that was something that was bugging me the entire time. I wanted to know what the hell was going on behind you. Yeah, these so are what cool. keeps me sane, man. Um, I'm into popping seeds and phenol hunting, and um, you know, plant medicine is a huge uh, factor in my life, and um, just being around them is, you know amazing thing and it's like uh the yin and yang because uh you know almost all the cannabis plants you know i have are uh, very feminine and they carry a very feminine energy and you know san pedro's are like masculine you know male energy uh in peru you know ayahuasca is the mother and the san pedro is the father and um they just bring a uh, balance to my life you know they're just like I just the most beautiful thing. I just could take bong hits and stare at them all day, man. <laughs> it's really neat that they're just towers everywhere. Anyways, yeah, that they, they but, do really do, do really well on the California coast, and you can actually have them everywhere. Um, you know, you put a greenhouse up, put a heater in them. People have them in Colorado and Maine, and you know, everybody should have a few of them. You know, they're hundred percent legal in all fifty states, so you should be growing a few. Well, I know people are going to be super stoked to listen to this episode. We got the librarian on. Thank you so much. And uh, I guess I'll wind it down here. Appreciate y'all. Um, yeah, yeah thank hope you. you guys have fun at that viewing tonight. And uh, Adam, you should uh, give Bob uh, a couple donuts. <laughs> yeah, I, I would love to. Okay, bye. All right, guys. Maybe banana guy, maybe. Okay, bye. All right.